Bonjour mes amis, it's Diane. Welcome back to my channel where we talk about everyday French life and beyond. And today's video is all about organic wine. So before we get into it, if we've never met, I am the American blogger behind the Living Abroad Lifestyle blog, We in France. So check that out if you get a minute. Also check out the video I did a couple of weeks ago with Kathy from The Tasting Room. I have no affiliation with them, but they're just an amazing wine tour company. Um, a tour I took myself nine years ago and still talk about today. So show her some love in that video that I'll link down below, but let's get right into it with Peter Hahn of Le Clou de la Mellerie. I'm Peter Hahn, uh, a winemaker in the Vouvray Appellation of France. Uh, the vineyard is called Le Clos de la Mellerie. Uh, it's a small winery, a uh, four hectare winery, and we do 100% Chenin Blanc grapes. The approach that we take is natural winemaking, and so all of our grapes are grown organically. Um, and that means that you know it's, there's a lot more uh, handwork. Uh, it's labor intensive, and we also do something that is really quite unusual, which is you see behind me. Uh, we do part of the vineyard uh, with what they call traction animal, so working with horse and plow uh, instead of a tractor. Uh, and that's actually something that's becoming more and more popular in certain parts of France. The vines here are also quite old, so the vines that you see behind me are uh, around 60 years old. All right, these were, in fact, we saw recently, these were planted, I think, in 50, 1956. So how old does that make them? Older than that. They're old vines, so, which means they're not terribly productive. So vines that are younger are more productive, but older vines tend to give more concentrated uh, fruit and more concentrated flavors. Uh, you can see that the uh, the soil, the ground is there's lots of growth. There's lots of uh, it's alive, and that's sort of in contrast, which I, I'll show you later, with vineyards that uh, that are not organic, uh, because we don't use any herbicides, we don't use any pesticides, uh, and that's you know that's an important part of uh, of organic farming. Uh, so this is really the very beginning of the season, and one of the things that you need to do in the beginning of the season in organic farming is you've got to plow uh, the field. So both underneath the vines and between the rows. And all of that is about airing the soil, oxygenating the soil, and also essentially getting rid of the growth. Because if you don't do that, then all of this stuff is just gonna grow up and you know cover your vines and trap the humidity, which also is not great for, uh, in terms of fungal disease and whatnot. So that's what we're doing, uh, that's what we're doing today. Uh, so if you want to, to find that balance, that n more natural balance in the soil, uh, yeah, it takes more time. Uh, you have to learn how to do it. It's a little bit more technical, um, but you know, for me, it's worth it, obviously. Really, the consumer has to be willing to pay that little bit extra to get uh, products that are farmed organically and not using herb herbicides and pesticides and whatnot. This is sort of all about passion and getting getting away from uh, what seemed to me a you know a lifestyle that was not not very close to nature not very close to uh, the cycles of nature uh, and so for me this was all about a project of, uh, of lifestyle uh, and of how I wanted to, uh, to spend my time you know, doing something that seemed valuable to me uh, and environmental concerns are increasingly important uh, and I think um, you know, the, our approach to winemaking and our approach to farming is something that uh, is partially about a philosophy. It's about, you know, how do we want to leave this planet for the future generations? Uh, 
Bonjour, donc Philippe Chigard, je suis avec euh, Urban, une jument percheron, qui d'ailleurs a 25% de sang américain, c'est un croisement avec un percheron américain, ça, percheron français et percheron américain, qui, bah, on vient travailler depuis 5-6 ans, je suis chez Peter, euh, cette parcelle. Donc notre travail consiste à éviter la concurrence de la vigne euh, avec l'herbe, donc on fait un butage, c'est-à-dire qu'on ramène la terre pour étouffer l'herbe euh, sous le rang des, des vignes et après on griffera au milieu on fait des semis aussi euh, de fleurs pour euh, aider les abeilles que Peter a dans son bois et euh, voilà et on entretient régulièrement la vigne donc le cheval bah, il est d'une grande utilité parce qu'il fait très attention à la vigne il va doucement ça tasse pas les sols comme un tracteur on peut travailler nos vieilles vignes de, de Vouvray qui sont un petit peu tordues et qui, qui sont au niveau du sol plus facilement et puis le cheval, bah, il est dressé pour ça depuis longtemps. On se sert d'un vieux cheval, elle, elle a démarré tout de suite. Elle a quel âge Elle a 10 ans maintenant. Euh, elle a démarré tout de suite, on l'a mis à côté d'un vieux cheval. Et c'est vraiment par mimétisme, euh, il démarre, et regarde le vieux cheval travailler et fait pareil. Quoi, en fait. ça, ça va assez vite. C'est des chevaux calmes hein, dans leur tête, ils sont tranquilles, euh, qui sont sélectionnés un petit peu pour ça aussi. Un vrai partenaire en fait. D'accord. Ouais, c'est un partenaire, on travaille à deux. Plus que ça, c'est mon, mon collègue de travail. <rire> tous les jours et c'est un collègue qui est plutôt sympathique ouais, ça se passe bien il bah, y a une connexion de toute façon ils sentent tout hein. euh, on le voit bien les jours nous on n'est pas en forme bah, eux ils vont être un peu perdus parce qu'ils sentent bien que derrière on suit pas et inversement il faut être aussi à l'écoute des fois que le cheval va pas être forcément en forme pour des raisons diverses et variées et dans ces cas là nous on sait aussi reconnaître à la respiration à plein de choses on va faire une journée un peu plus courte ou des temps de pause un peu plus long euh, au bout des rangs euh, automatiquement on doit s'adapter à eux Forme. Moi, je fais, moi je, depuis 8 ans, on avait monté une formation en boise pour former des adultes qui vont travailler partout en France. Il y a une grosse demande en France actuellement. Il y a énormément de grands domaines. Pratiquement tous les grands domaines français veulent réintégrer le cheval dans leur vie. Ouais. Donc ça, il y a une forte demande. Et le problème, c'est qu'on a oublié les techniques. Donc il faut réapprendre. C'est pour ça qu'on avait mis en place une formation pour réapprendre tout ça. Autant d'hommes que de femmes, d'ailleurs, c'est très mixte. Comme métier et ça se développe énormément. Ouais. Enfin, ça. Après il faut aussi avoir la connaissance du, de la terre, de la vigne, etc. Il ne faut pas que des spécialistes du cheval. Euh, au départ on prenait des spécialistes du cheval pour ce métier et on s'est un peu trompé. En fait il vaut mieux prendre des spécialistes de la vigne parce qu'on est le cheval et moi je suis au service de la vigne. Donc si on ne comprend pas la plante, on va avoir des actions peut-être techniques dans le sol mais qui n'auront aucun intérêt pour la vigne. Euh, il va vraiment falloir, Alors, maintenant on cherche plus des gens qui sont ouvriers viticoles avec la passion de, de ce travail-là et on les forme au cheval. Ça, reste, ça fonctionne mieux en fait. So, I mean, one of the signs of organic farming is what, you, what, what you're looking for is when the, the soil is worked. You're plowing it, you're working with the soil, and you can see the soil, it's really light, and it's well aired, you've got oxygen uh, getting back into the soil. You can see insects, uh, there are, you know, you'll see worms when you start plowing the soil. There's a life, there's a balance in the soil, where most farming these days, unfortunately, uh, it's not like that. So it's not, the soil's not worked, it's not plowed, it's flat, it's like concrete, uh, and they're constantly, you know, spraying herbicides and whatnot to get rid of the, the growth, and essentially you're killing the soil. So one of the techniques that we use, which is sort of old fashioned, it kind of goes well with the, you know, working with a horse and plow and whatnot, uh, is to create a new vine instead of going to the vine nursery and getting a grafted vine, uh, a plant. Uh, we use uh, a technique called marcotage, which is uh, a time honored technique where we take the branch from an old vine So you can see this is an old vine, it's probably whatever we said, 60 years. You take the branch, you put it into the ground, it then comes out up here and you create a baby vine. All right, so now this vine is now being nourished by the mother vine, as we say, and in a couple of years, we'll just cut 
this branch and we've got a new vine. And what you're doing is instead of, uh, instead of, as I said, going and buying a vine somewhere, you're actually keeping the genetic heritage of your vineyard, right? So this vine is essentially a 60 year old vine that's been here for, you know, since then, and it's part of the vineyard as opposed to bringing in stuff from, uh, from elsewhere. So that's a, that's a technique that we use. It's not very common because it obviously it takes more time and effort than going and buying a vine, digging a hole and sticking it in and planting it. So one of the things, not, not only do we hand pick the grapes, which, you know, oddly enough, most people think, you know, grapes are hand picked. You, you see lots of people out in the vines picking the grapes. Probably less than 5% of wine grapes globally are picked by hand. They're picked by machines these days. So essentially the machine goes through and it has these beating things that hit the vines. Grapes fall off. The problem with that is, is that you get everything that's on the vine. And like any natural organism, not every grape on every vine is the same. Sometimes you've got grapes that are less ripe. Sometimes you've got grapes that have some rot on them. When you hand pick the grapes, you go in and you pick the grapes that are good, that you want. Then you can leave the ones that aren't ripe. You can leave them for another three days, four days, another week. You can come back into the vineyard and pick those grapes. The problem with the, the sort of the high-tech winemaking is that you've lost all of that. One, one of the, I think, interesting things about our approach is it's very low-tech. So we kind of make wine like they made wine, you know, 100 years ago and further. Since the 1950s, 60s, technology has kind of taken over winemaking. So for example, picking grapes, there's, there's, there's technology now. You go out and you can test the grapes and you can see exactly how much acidity you've got in the grapes, how much, how much sugar you've got, what the tannins are like, uh, what the phenolic ripeness is. And that's all done on, uh, in a lab. And you can use that data then to decide when you pick your grapes and try to try to get the, the exact type of wine that you want to make. That's a, that's fine, and that's one approach to winemaking. Our approach is we don't do any of that analysis. Essentially, all we do is what they used to do for thousands of years, making wine. Is you go out and you taste the grapes, and you see if the juice is tasting right, if it tastes ripe, if it tastes interesting, sweet, etc. And you pick based on that. What that means, though, is that we, we can't get the same type of wine each year uh, because we're not using, you know, these very fine-tuned measurements. We're essentially looking at the sky, we're looking at the weather, looking at the weather forecast, taste the grapes. We say, oh well, looks like we're going to have another week of sun. Let's let's let the grapes get a little riper. And so what that means is we have a real vintage effect, and uh, it's something that people talk about. Oh, that was a good vintage. We've basically lost the vintage effect. Everyone's trying to make the same wine each year with the same kind of flavor profile. And you can do that more and more because of the technology. Our wines, every year it's different. Some wines, there'll be a little sweetness in it. Some, some, some years will be completely dry. There are some years that it's almost a Licoro wine where it's, a, where it's incredibly sweet, what's well, known as a dessert wine. And all of that is because we're doing low intervention winemaking. We're intervening as little as possible we're letting nature take its course. So these are vines, these are young vines. We planted these three years ago. Uh, and uh, to try to maintain the, the authenticity of our vineyard, we, we use cuttings from our vines. We take them to nursery, the nursery grows them, and they graft them onto uh, North American rootstock, which actually protects them from phylloxera. So essentially the graft is done down here. And then this is the Chenin uh, grape uh, variety here. And this is the uh, the uh, rootstock that uh, that prevents phylloxera. And these are, as I said, three years old. In Vouvray Appellation, you don't you're not allowed to pick the grapes and make wine uh, until the third year. And the idea is that because they're young vines, uh, you need a bit of maturity. The very young vines give grapes that are not sort of high quality. And ideally. You know, 10 to 15 years is when you really start getting grapes that have an interesting complexity and flavor profile. So, you know, wine may, it's really a long, a long term project. Um, and I kind of feel like, in a sense, the vines that we're planting today, uh, it's gonna, it's almost for the, you know, for the next generation. It's kind of for, for my kids because, you know, to me, when these are 30 years old, that's when, that's when I really want to make wine with them. So. So this is our press. It's, uh, it's basically as low-tech as you can get in winemaking today. 
Uh, it's about 100 years old. It's a manual press, so there's no electric power uh, involved. Um, what's nice about it, I mean, it's not it's sort of there's novelty value, but um, what's nice about it is that it's it's a very slow and gentle press. So you can't you can't press the hell out of the grapes like modern presses can. Essentially, you've got to you've got to go slow. You have no choice, and you can't put a lot of pressure on the grapes. So you're really only getting the first press or the first run juice in a way. You're getting the purest, the cleanest juice. It's a lot of work. I mean, that's the downside. It's kind of like you know, like most of these things. But you know, what's nice is that because the vines are all around the property, close by to the winemaking building, we're picking by hand. The grapes come in in baskets. We put them straight into the press. Uh, we then press. It takes about three hours to do one press, um, and uh, and then essentially the juice goes into the barrels, and the wine kind of makes itself. So once the juice is pressed, comes out, goes into the vats for 24 hours for sedimentation. So any of the big bits and pieces and leaves and spiders or whatever will float to the top or sink to the bottom. Uh, so that's the, what they call debourbage or sedimentation. We then hook up a hose. There's a little trap in the back, goes down into the barrel cellar, which we'll check out in just a minute. And the juice, we just open the, the, uh, the valve and the juice goes down by gravity. We don't even have to pump it. So it's very low intervention and it goes down into the barrels. So this is the barrel cellar. The juice comes down after pressing, a day or two after pressing. And it goes straight into the barrels. And essentially we let the wine make itself in the barrels. It's indigenous yeast, so we don't add yeast. Most wine is made with genetically modified yeasts that give the wine a certain flavor, they ferment it more quickly, etc. Our fermentation can take up to six months. During that time, the wine is listening <laughs> to music. So we have uh, this here, we're, uh, we have Mozart, uh, and that's 24 seven in the, in the cellar. Uh, don't know if it does much, but uh, we like it, and hopefully the wine likes it. Uh, so wine in the barrels, fermentation, and then aging for 12 months. So this is wine from the latest vintage, which is the 2018 vintage. It's been in the barrel since October, or late September actually. Fermentation is just finishing, so there's still a little bit of bubbliness to it but we already can taste the wine that this is going to become. Uh, and it's, it's uh, the 18 vintage was a, was a great vintage, lots of sun, very rich, very ripe. Uh, and so we're probably gonna get a profile of like a dummy sec wine. So this is a sparkling 2012 that we called uh, Method Traditionnel. It's like uh, champagne method, but we're not allowed to say that, so we said method traditionnel. Uh, so this one in 2016, half dry, demi sec. This one, but the mysterious one, no, 2017, dry. And this is the 2015, moelleux. And what's, what's kind of interesting, I think, about our wines is we, we make one wine each vintage, except sometimes we'll make a sparkling wine, depending on the vintage, if, there's, if there are a few barrels that are kind of suitable for making a, a champagne-style wine. But otherwise, we make one wine, and it's an expression of the year. And every year, it can be very different, which is what I was explaining before about, about sort of low-tech, low-intervention winemaking. You know, if you, let, if you let the season play out, and you're not kind of trying to make a similar style of wine, You'll get different wines each year, depending on how much rainfall there was that season, how much, uh, how many hours of sunlight, uh, how cool the the late growing season is, and so really, it's you know the same vines, the same barrels, the same winemaking uh, process, but you're getting really different profiles of wine because of the approach that we take to making wine, which is this kind of low intervention, let nature play its its course, take its course. So most of our wines, these are wines that that are really, they're quite complex. Uh, they're, they're concentrated, they're a lot of, they're very rich, they're flavorful, and so often they're sold in restaurants. So wi wine waiters love our wines because they, they pair with a lot of 
different types of foods depending on the year. So obviously a wine with some residual sugar, a demi-sec or a moelleux, will pair with different foods than a drier wine or a sparkling wine. So they're, they're mostly sold in restaurants. Um, in the US, they're imported by a group called uh, Rosenthal, Rosenthal Wine Merchants. So anyone in the US who wants to get a hold of these can contact them their on their website. All right, everyone, that wraps up today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know if you learned anything down in the comments about organic wine. And be sure to check out my other wine video I did a couple of weeks ago on the tasting room and all about Loire Valley wines. Okay, see you soon. Salut.